So I um, started recording. So um, hello everybody, uh, good morning, good afternoon, whatever time it is where you are. Um, today's uh, GSC meeting I thought we would just use uh, for just a general discussion of a couple of different topics. Um, or if you have other topics, please feel free to uh, bring them up. And if you get done early, I guess you can always uh, stop whenever we run out of uh, steam. Um, so one of the topics was the um, um, Raven um, progress. Um, because we have a, a, a milestone review coming up in March 12th. Mm. Um, so just uh, if you can plan for that uh, with uh, whatever demos or updates. Um, next week, I'll be sending out uh, uh, the slide uh, Slideshow where we can um, mm -hmm. report the progress uh, and prepare it for the uh, master review. Um, speaking of that, uh, with uh, with the JDK 11, just a brief update. Uh, it kind of hit a snag, even though Basil 023 came out that supports JDK. Uh, we ran into a little bit of a snag where uh, the protobufs that are the Protobuf compilation generates Java code, which cannot at this time be compiled with JDK 11 because they depend on some some miscellaneous packages, which is a severe no-no. Uh, apparently, this is something that the Protobuf community is tracking, and so hopefully they'll address that soon. Um, anyway, so just a little curiosity. Uh, other than that, is there any other stuff, Ray, that you want to? Um, I don't think they're going towards that. Let's see. Um, we're officially, anyone who's doing Onos builds um, on the master branch, feel free to roll forward to Basil 0 0.23. That's my sort of quote unquote officially supported Basil now. That's what Jenkins is using. That's what Docker is using. Um, and we also, I don't know if people saw, we rolled forward a minor release in Carafe. Hopefully, it adds a little bit of stability into some of the OSGI stuff. So we're now on Carafe version 4.2.3. Yeah. On, on that note, do you mind maybe sending a message or a couple of messages announcing? Sure, I can do that. Developer community. Yep, I can do that. Keep them informed. I think that would be great. Um, Ray, just one question on the Basil upgrade. Uh, will Basil, I guess what we were using before was like 0 0.19. Two, I think. I don't remember exactly. Uh, will that still work with Master Branch? Because uh, uh, sometimes, at uh, least my personal development uh, goes both on Tool and on Master. And uh, if uh, 0 0.19.2 works on Master but not on Tool, uh, sorry, 0 0.19.2 works on both, I would like to keep that for now. Is that possible? I think, or I think the lowest common denominator right now is 21. We also, as part of this upgrade, had to upgrade the um, Node.js rules that we use, and those require a minimum of 21. I decided to go all the way to 23. You don't have to. I think you're okay using 21 for both. Oh, maybe I'm already using 21 now. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. The thing is, if you, if you do build master and you don't use the upgraded one, You'll have to throw some really ugly command line in there to um, command line option to suppress a warning. So if you don't want to do that, then roll all the way forward to 23. I know it's annoying to swap back and forth. All right. Okay. Thanks. And generally, we would try to keep uh, support for a range of Basil because that way it keeps it a little yeah. bit easier not to have to have every, everybody running in lockstep and also yeah. port some of those changes to multiple recent branches so that developers don't have to do this uh, yo-yoing back and forth. Yeah, I mean, one thing we could do, that you raised a good point, though, is we could, I'll look in to see how much work is involved. I could make at least... 2.0 and 1.15 compatible with the most up-to-date one. And then for most developers, they'd never have to switch. Yeah. Um, my concern with that is this change I had to make to Node.js. I don't know what the bubble out for that's going to be. I see. Um, but I'll, I'll look at it. That's a good idea. Thanks, Ray. 
All right. So also regarding the release, so not necessarily Raven uh, specifically, but just releases in general. Uh, yesterday, uh, Carmel asked a really good question. What about change logs and or release notes that we used to have that Bill puts together, Daniel put together, and then I kind of dropped the ball on doing that. Um, we have a couple of releases that don't really have release notes. Um, what I would like to do, um, I mean, we have a couple of different choices, but what I would like to do is, as much as possible would be to keep this information in Garrett rather than put it on Google Docs sure. or Wiki. Um, I mean, it can be on a Wiki too, um, I suppose, but I would prefer to keep it in, in, in source control, in, in source control yeah, yeah. where the code is. Um, so we have a couple of different options. We can either set up for like a running change log in reverse chronological order that we can add releases. We can, you know, start sections for this. Uh, even like we could start a, you know, Raven section, and then have the people who are adding new features simply add to the to the document. Mm -hmm. It would be a, you know, markdown document. That's one way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Another way would be to set up a separate markdown document for each release. Mm -hmm. uh, that would potentially allow it to be uh, more verbose. Yeah, I, I don't know. My, my thought was just, uh, I discussed some of these options with Carmelo yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, if there's any preferences on this, uh, well, feel free I will to say I really like the way um, Basil does this. Exactly, yeah. So what Basil does is they do everything on GitHub, mm -hmm. including their downloads of the new versions. When you go to the downloads page, they have the equivalent of this change log, basically for each, you've seen, you've mm -hmm. done, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I like that. I, from a high level of someone who's not really that involved with the innards, but likes to keep up on like the JDK changes and whatnot, I find that really useful. Uh, the problem is we don't use GitHub for our downloads. I don't know like if there's an equivalent for us. I mean, we could just have a, we could just without the, having the download section, we could just have the just the change it. file. They just the changes, right? Yeah. Well, can can the change log just be generated from either the Jira's? or the commit messages in Garrett? Yeah, that's something that Carmela and I briefly discussed yesterday. I mean, we should probably start with that, at least yeah. maybe even retroactively for the past few releases, <coughs> but we don't have any. Yeah. any but my point being, people aren't gonna keep a markdown document up to date, right? The reality is, the ch is either A, JIRA, which at some level isn't kept up to date, because not every commit has a JIRA associated with it. So really the only truth here is the commit messages. That is true. Yeah, the only problem is uh, sometimes those are not in a sense phrase the, and the, the most helpful way. But yeah. I suppose it's better than nothing, right? So I mean, I, I well, I, then I, then I, we can I, fix that, right? <laughs> we just got to be yeah. more diligent about what we accept and what we write as commit messages. Yeah, we can also um, like a dumb example, but I've been doing a lot of removing deprecated code lately. Um, People don't need to see all those check-ins. They want to see one that says remove deprecated code, right? They don't want to see here are the 27 check-ins to do that. It's probably not terribly useful information. But I think it's a good place to start. Like maybe we start with that and then prune it down. Um, um, so usually, I mean, usually what I've seen open source projects do is use different tags in the commit messages that would allow some process that's reading the commit messages to filter the ones that you uh, that are relevant to actual features that are added for uh, a change log, so that's one option. Interesting idea. Also, what uh, we were doing before, if I don't remember, if I remember correctly, was like Bill sending out the document and asking people to put uh, stuff in it that they deemed uh, interesting, and then we had a change log of every commit. So, in my opinion, we could do the same with just a markdown document. You send it out uh, like before the release. Uh, like in the in the freeze time, you send it out and say list your things, and everybody lists the things that he feels are important. Like Ray, you say uh, major refactoring of deprecated code, uh, and maybe you list the two major things that were removed in there. I add some ODTN related stuff. I made other some before, like uh, refactoring the provider, and that's a major thing that we add manually, and then you have the whole change log. Yeah. So the thing is, we would have to sort of somehow couple it uh, more tightly with the release process or the yeah. um, called the release review. 
because that's exactly what we are following, but that we sort of fell off the wagon, right? Yep. Because it just takes a little bit to slip up and yep. then you get busy with planning for next release and start next release and then, then the release notes never happen, which is exactly what happened for Right, which is again why I'm in favor of, of the using the Garrett because that's always there. Yeah, yeah, it, it, uh, I, I, I would tend to agree with that, uh, with the caveat that uh, we would have to be more diligent or, or, or about scrutinizing the quality of those messages. Yep. Or, as Jordan suggested, establish some sort of a convention uh, through which um, the, you know, the more significant check ins could be. Uh, yeah. Or, or, yeah, you can provide a little description as well as the one line commit messages. So at least something to try. It seems like what we probably ought to do at least very minimum would be to run a couple of different queries for the past few releases so that we can just generate a um, document. Yeah. Change log is yeah. straightforward. Uh, see, I would like to, but I would still like to do it as a markdown file. Mm -hmm. um, that way it's in the code, it's, you know, accessible. Um, because the problem with a Google Doc is they got on a Google Drive and you have sort of this nebulous ownership of it yeah. and it yeah, right. get lost. Uh, so um, I think those are great for collaborative purposes, but um, for certain kind of collaborative processes, but the markdown mm -hmm. here would be better on that. Anyway, so that's, that's kind of that's kind of one of the topics. So. Um, so maybe what I will do is um, I'll start the change log document. Uh, any suggestions as to whether it ought to be one per release or just running log? So, so I, I'm, I'm I'm confused. Are we doing it via the Garrett or are we doing it via a manually written document? Yeah. So no. So okay. I guess maybe there's oh. a couple of different ways okay. we can do that. Uh, I thought it was to do it through. Garrett effectively yeah. or, or yeah. Git, yeah. basically running the change log, right? Using using whatever was checked in, but then basically running one-time query for changes that were done in that release and uh, producing a markdown file from this. That ah, okay, done. okay, that makes sense. Yeah. I think what I like about that, that is you can then look at that, and if you want to do the higher level thing, you can. It's you get right in front of you. Yeah. Exactly. Right. 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 That's, I like that. That's a good idea. So I think it makes more. I think it makes sense to do this in one document, one markdown document with just yeah. sections and releases, because if somebody's going through trying to see what was added in the last few releases, it's kind of a pain to be opening different files. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think I think that's what at least the Carmelo you were suggesting as well yesterday, right? So. Right. Yes. Okay. Most so, recent, most recent at the top, type of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I'll I'll um, have Brian help me um, with the get it query up because this is something I'm a little bit lame at. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'll set up the document and, and the script to basically generate this uh, kind of a, generate a new section when we need it to. All right. So that's that. Um, Another topic was uh, just to kind of uh, regroup on the uh, ONOS apps list repository. Mm -hmm. So we have that sort of a one-time use tool that I put together to basically scrape the build files, uh, these, these are build files, and generate the apps YAML for all of the built-in apps, uh, at least uh, the ones that have released just for the last release, which is the 2.0 version of this. We talked in the email conversation about adding past versions for this as well. Um, this would be something more difficult to do tool and I would prefer not to do it. So this is maybe something we can ask like a summer intern or somebody to do, to add the additional versions or people can add other versions for the apps that they care about for past. Uh, but I think right now this might I would like to see is adding the external apps. So, for example, like the CBA and Volta apps that we have, which is like the AAA, the ACA, 
ADL and whatnot, right? All of those apps would be great to now add manually to the YAML file for all of their versions. Um, Agreed. Does have we communicated to someone on those teams that this thing exists and they we hey it'd be good to have them you put that stuff there? So no. So this is where I was hoping that maybe I could get some help if, if uh, folks can do that. Uh, you know I don't have very strong ties to those teams. Um, so if, if uh, folks could uh, basically contact uh, those teams and. Ask them to do it. I know that, for example, you're working with, uh, you're working on this stuff, David, right? So maybe if this is where you could help. Yeah, I'll, I'll see what I can weasel out of some people. Yeah, and it's we're really, we're just talking about a few lines of YAML, just add that. It doesn't have to be. Yeah, it's, it's not a lot of work. <laughs> no, no, I understand. But my, my point was if you could do this in uh, just an incremental fashion, just add an app or two at a time, yep. it doesn't have to be all or nothing, right? Um, or just add the most recent, the current version, and then we can worry about the past versions. Because so that's one thing, right? Is to populate, have the completeness of that sort of quote unquote database. Um, what I would also like to do is, in order to, you know, right now it's just YAML file, so it's kind of inert and not really very useful other than for somebody to take a look at. What I would like to do is, you know, use one of the summer interns and. One of the candidates I've actually talked about this already and he seemed to have been interested would be to start using this information. So uh, how it could be used would be many different ways. So for example, it could be we could produce a, again a markdown file from this to potentially some sort of a um, uh, application that can be or web page that can be you can look at this offline and potentially yep. search this information offline or uh, and or I should I say and um, another uh, possibility is um, to augment the existing commands in ONOS and REST APIs in ONOS as well as the UI in ONOS to effectively consider this as a source as a catalog in addition to um, the kind of the, the applications that are already installed on a disk uh, as part of the distribution. This would allow us to, put, for example, to produce a minimal distribution of ONOS that has nothing in it but, let's say, the default drivers. That's right there, half the size of the tarball. And yep. then if the comments in there had this, uh, had the ability to be, able to say, you know, app install and even have, they even have like a tab completion, right, for the applications that are not on as part of distribution, but rather that are part of the sort of the uh, public database. Then we'll make it much easier to ignite apps without having to, you know, download them only when you need them, and, and do that those sorts of things. So um, that's something I would like uh, one of the interns to work on in the summer. Uh, okay, that that sounds great. I, I actually like that idea a lot. Because right yeah, now, same here. Yeah, because right now um, it's maintaining information and investing in the creating the YAML file, but clearly it's, we need to start making use of it in order to get a yeah. return on investment. Yeah, my take was, uh, at least when we discussed this, was that first step would be a, like a, a simple page that everybody can look at and say that these are the apps that we, are, take, we know of. And uh, in this way, other people can add to it. Uh, and then, uh, that page would be referenced, for example, from the wiki page or uh, even the Autos website. Uh, and that's like the first step we talked about. And then I really like the idea of uh, using this to make a, a smaller size conciser Autos. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think we should start with that kind of offline uh, page to, to be able to view it so they can. Yeah. All right, so it looks like at least we're on the same page for that. Um, and we can see if uh, this one intern could do all of this or if he would need to split it up. Okay, um, next gen on us stuff. Uh, so we're making this, you know, progress, though small, uh, slow progress. Um, I don't know if folks were uh, keeping up on some of the discussions. Uh, Guru's preference would be that we tackle uh, the configuration and management bits first. Uh, the reason being here is that um, 
we'll make sure that we have it for the next gen stuff and also uh, because this is something if you design it correctly it can actually sit alongside existing on us and can benefit not just the next generation platform but also the current platform and so Andrea is driving that he set up a document uh, where we're starting to put some of our thoughts um, the general idea here is for the management configuration piece is to use GNMI for northbound as well as for southbound as the canonical interfaces. And the reason here is that it's a remote interface with nice semantics for transactionality. It's a very tight interface in a sense. There are very few methods to it. Um, and it's flexible to convey arbitrary um, data which can be defined by end. And this way we could engage with Stratum devices without having effectively any intermediate layer uh, of drivers or providers or anything like that. But of course, in order to add support for the devices that don't conform to the Stratum, um, put you know, a fingerprint uh, and, and use, uh, book, you know, let's say they use a RESTConf or NetConf for other means of uh, management. Then for those, we would provide effectively an adaptive layer that would have gRPC on one end and then whatever protocol uh, to talk to the device on the other. So this would effectively turn the kind of the logical driver layer that we have in on us today into a separate component of the architecture. Um, it will be managed and ignited uh, through Kubernetes or whatever. Do, do we see um, open config then as the general model? So right now, if you look at Onos, I would say there's essentially a flow-based model, a data plane model that's at its core. Are you seeing open config at the core of this management model then? Yes. Um, yeah, uh, definitely open config is uh, what we are going to use as a model to build uh, the system. Uh, nothing prevents you to uh, work with uh, your given model uh, for the devices or open config augmentations because really GNMI does not impose a given model. Uh, so the configuration subsystem sh uh, will be built in a way where the model for the device uh, and the different type of models are, are not that important, it would be opaque, opaque to the exact model. We will use open config because that's what Stratum uses. So it's going to be, and also it's well adopted also, for example, in ODTN uh, as a use case. Uh, so it would be definitely uh, possible to have other models. Open config is what we are going to build it against. Uh, yeah, I mean, one of, yeah, one of my arguments to people of going back to the ODL Onos battle was Onos had a centralized, central unifying model that all devices meant to comply with. Every device looked like a flow switch. Where ODL basically said through NetConf, you can expose any model you want. What that meant is I didn't have a unifying model and I had to know specifics about each device and each device interface so I managed it. When exactly. we go forward, going forward to look at the management API here, if we don't have a unifying model and we say, hey, whatever model you want to present northbound, present northbound, we haven't um, actually solved any problems, yeah, so right? We just said, Here's a new place to go to. Sorry, David, go ahead. No, no, that's okay. I, so, so this is what I'm trying to understand is if we're going to follow that same model paradigm that Onos didn't say, look, we're going to have a unifying model and we're going to adapt, expect people to adapt devices to that model as opposed to expose any given model. Yes, that's basically the idea is the GNM. So, but, but it's a two different layers. It's Decoupled, right? So GNMI is the canonical interface to the south, but of course that interface by itself means nothing because it doesn't convey any, it doesn't tell you anything about the abstractions of the data or the configuration model, right? So, so at one level, that's the universal. Uh, so uh, no, no, slightly higher above that will be adoption or, or, or reliance on open config as the canonical model for managing various aspects of devices. So that would kind of provide you this unifying model okay. that, you, that you just pointed out. But there's a but. 
But of course, if you have some strange beast of a device that, that let's say, con open config doesn't provide a channel to configure or standard for configuring certain aspects that you care about, you can always define your model or, or bring that particular model uh, to the table. And of course, it will rely on the fact that not only you have the device, but also you have some application about the management plane that understands what that model is and what kind of yeah. buttons to, to turn in order to make the device do something intelligible. Yep. Um, so Google's been kind of also going down the whole why got path. You mentioned that in your, your meeting minute prep. Right. We're going to define management models in Yang and then use why got to essentially convert those to a Go interface. Um, and we're looking at Yang specification as a core to the models here. Yes, yeah, so, uh, so definitely YGOD will be the tool, uh, to, to, tool chain that we will rely on. I've actually uh, ran some um, uh, quick experiments um, with respect to, let's say, and this is a somewhat slight tangent here. Uh, one of the things for, um, for both the next gen platform as well as for the kind of the intermediate solution will be what ups, what abstraction we will adopt for topology yeah uh, because today we have a nice flat simple abstraction of a graph actually using just a generic graph library uh, that we portray the topology app um, but that's java and it's internal um, while it's efficient it's not something that lends itself for easy um, kind of conversion to language neutral form and so rather than, again, rather than just like with GNMI, rather than coming up with our own southbound interface, we would use GNMI. Uh, same thing with uh, topology model. Is there a topology model that we can just use? Uh, one of the thoughts that Andrea and I were discussing was TAPI. They have some notions of topology. Yep. But I also looked at the existing RFC standards, which actually one of them is RFC, if I recall correctly, 8345, eight, eight, which was um, put forth by our friends from ODL, actually, and from Cisco and uh, Huawei. Um, it's basically a fairly generic uh, network and network topology model, which provides for stacking topologies on one another in the form of like virtual networks. And, but that one is using Yang 1.1. However, so I was a little bit concerned that it wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to use the YGOT tools on it because the YGOT tools really support 1.0 with some extensions to support some of the Yang one one concepts. Right, but but are we looking at Yang as kind of the underlying way to define interfaces for the management over genome, you know, as well as potentially for topology? Is that going to be core to kind of the 2.0 going forward? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, in terms of topology, stack topologies are nice. Also having multiple topologies, right? Basically yes. saying, you know, I have a bunch of devices and I can overlay uh, in multiple different topologies. Correct. Yes. Okay. And and uh, this model also it provides a base model on top of which you can then uh, run a layer of augmentations for various different network types, so that you can augment it with you know optical parameters or wireless parameters or whatnot. Right. So yeah, uh, and kind of bringing that back to you know, the, the, I think the point I was trying to make originally was when I add a new device or you, you call this kind of beast device that doesn't comply to our current model. Are we expecting them to define that new API into that new model in Yang and bring and use that as a mechanism to get into to Onos V2? I'm just trying to make sure I understand that correctly. Yeah, so the, uh, the idea here is that uh, Onos will rely primarily on open config as, as a means of device configuration, device management, and it's up to the devices or software layered on top of those devices, whether directly on the devices or kind of shipped alongside as a driver for the next gen Onos. It, it's the, the, the responsibility lies with kind of the device or device manufacturer. Okay. Okay. Now, um, the, the other, go ahead. go ahead. Okay. The other question I had is you talked about gRPC as a northbound API, and that's fine for a programmatic API, but often when I'm working with Onus, I also uh, do interactive API calls via REST and curl, right? How does that, you see that happening if my only northbound is gRPC? I don't know of a girl, if you will, <laughs> a, a curl for gRPC. Maybe there is one. I just don't know about it. 
Oh, I guess when I said canonical, okay, so yeah, that's a, that's a great question. When I said canonical, what I meant is, is just like uh, the Java API is a canonical API where we kind of we define the interfaces in today's on us, right? And then we write the commands and and REST APIs on top of that today. Okay. Right? So okay. the part here would be that, yes, obviously we would support REST API. Like, but again, that REST API may not be comprehensive, like it is not today, right? The gRPC allows you to do uh, certain things, just like the Java API today allows you to do certain things that the REST API, the command line, may not allow you to do. Um, if I may intervene here, my take on this is that uh, uh, we could expose northbound gRPC and then build uh, in the whole point of being a separate piece of components build a REST API apart from the core, call it that way, which exposes the gRPC API. Uh, on top of the gRPC API, would uh, uh, build the shim layer that exposes REST or exposes CLI or whatnot. Yeah, I, I would expect that as a separate shim. I mean, I guess there are GR, gRP curl. So there are different curl-like things that people have done for gRPC and maybe, Maybe we don't need REST so much. Exactly. Maybe you want to expose some, some subset of things. And uh, uh, a shim layer can be even uh, somebody wants to build a RESTCOM shim layer, just go ahead and do it. Uh, yeah, exactly. build, a, build a NETCOM shim layer, please be my guest. Uh, the point is that you're talking gRPC, and that is less tainting within those, call it core. Uh, because it's a well-known and well-defined interface. Well, uh, uh, and right now it's mainly uh, Java, which uh, it's, it tight, it, it couples it tighter between the different components. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> One other thing on the topic is that uh, there is a gRPC gateway that can read the proto spec and generate the REST API automatically. So it wouldn't necessarily be REST comp compliant, but if you just wanted the ability to curl, that would give that to you. Have you tried any of the GRP curl stuff? Has anybody tried any of that to see how that well that worked? I haven't heard of GRPC curl, but um, I have I did a quick heard of search. GRPC. Sorry? I just did a quick Google search on, on there's some projects on GitHub that claim to do it. I was curious if anybody yeah. tried it. Carmelo put the link on it, and the previous there's link was the. They also did something in Volta, uh, which was like, I forget what they called that component, but I mean, there, I think there are a number of, um, oh, this is a command line tool. This is uh, on the client side. Um, there's also people that have solved the problem by exposing a REST API and then using regular yeah. curl. Yeah, so we have multiple yeah. and actually, you know, it's because we're kind of assembling things from fairly standard blocks here, uh, nothing precludes, uh, even if you just let they focus on one by default, nothing precludes others from using the other alternate versions, right? So, uh, and, go ahead. And my take on this is that uh, since it's more modular, uh, it's actually easier for people to build in things. Like right now, to build a REST API on top of an existing app, you kind of have to do some things in Java. Uh, and you kind of have to know Java, and you kind of have to know the whole deployment process of Onos and do things like that. Instead, here, it, in my opinion, it's easier because uh, you're building against the gRPC interface. You can write it in whatever language you want and stuff like that. Exactly. Yep. Anyway, so those, those are kind of uh, just an update on some discussions and additional thoughts uh, from what we discussed uh, last time. So we're going yeah. to document these things both in that next gen Onos document, um, as well as in a separate document that uh, Andrea set up for the configuration bit. Um, uh, Guru, uh, hey, let me just say yeah. something. Guru, oh, I'll sure. have to track the configuration stuff separately because he would like to make sure we're kind of focusing on the progress in that realm first. Anyway, I'm done. Go ahead, Andrea. Uh, yeah, I was just about to say that uh, the link you can find it in the chat, and uh, uh, Tom, maybe we can put it in the in the wiki in the page um, there. 
Um, and also, if you have any comments or any thoughts, any anything about uh, that document, feel free to comment on it or reach out to me, or Thomas, uh, with whatever question thoughts you have. We're really much looking forward uh, on discussing these things. So, yep. feel free. And uh, any uh, any comment is more than welcome because also we know something. But like David, you're more then you know a lot more about like southbound related things on like non stratum devices. So any comments is more than welcome. I, I wouldn't say I know anything, but okay. Quick detail on the, on the topology stuff and on the WIGO tools. Um, I actually got in touch. I was having some issues building that uh, because the one of the Yang one one syntax bits uh, that those models were using was not passing through the YGO tools. Um, so I got in touch with um, Rob and Anis from Google who were kind of maintaining this uh, tool and they were able to submit a PR right there on the spot uh, and to fix the problem. So we are actually able to compile those uh, Yang one one models, those particular two that I list on the wiki page here. Uh, you're able to compile those off the shelf. So, so it means that uh, we should be able to use that particle model for um, as a basis for our topology. All right. Um, next item is uh, just a more of a kind of reminder, uh, reiteration of the message that you've gotten from Joe, is we have uh, TST elections coming up. So uh, uh, there were, at least I already put some nominations up, uh, but people, if people are interested, please um, don't hesitate to throw your hat in the ring. Um, as you can see this, uh, you know, coming up here will be quite exciting with, uh, with working on the next generation stuff. And so it will be good to have uh, participation from community in general. Um, we'll have actually an extra uh, seat open. We've reached out to Jono, um, who basically said, uh, even though he has another year of, uh, of the TST, he basically gave up his seat since he's not actively involved in the project anymore. I think he Hope he's doing well. <clears throat> I'm sorry? Hope he's doing well and enjoying himself. Uh, seems like it. Seems like it. Poor guy has to work with Ali, though, so. <laughs> well, for every ying, there's a yang. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, so that's kind of all I had. If there's any other topics that folks would like to bring up, uh, please, um, I'll shut up and let you speak up. All right, doesn't sound like it, I guess. In that case, uh, why don't we call the meeting done and see everybody in two weeks. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank bye. you. Bye. Thank you, bye.